Welcome to the Growth Whispers podcast, where everything that Kevin and Brad talk about is to do with building enduring great companies because we like it. We like to see companies continue to grow and thrive over time, getting better and smarter and having a bigger impact on their team and the the culture or the culture, the, the constituents that they serve in their community or their business, whatever it happens to be. Uh, great to be here today, Brad. Brad, uh, how are you doing? And what's kind of the, what's the kind of word or phrase that's on your mind or concept that's on your mind today? I'm better than I was before. Cause I just heard you refer to yourself in the third person. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was, that was it. Tony. I'm so. glad, I'm glad I could provide you a little joy in your day. <laughs> yeah, I'm good. Word of phrase of the day. Debt. Debt, 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 debt. Now this, this uh, episode today is about onboarding debt, but yeah, it's interesting. I saw someone uh, talking about this serviceability of their mortgage, how it's gone, how it's pretty much doubled in the last year and a half to two years. Um, and yeah, how uh, that's having the intended consequences through the economy. <laughs> awesome. Well, mine is perspective. You know, I just spent um, close a week, 10 days in the Middle East, uh, in Dubai, working with some companies and you know, I've spent, oh my God, I had, before this, I'd done 54 trips to Dubai. I went there every quarter for 13 years. Yeah. And it's like my second home. And I love that place. And I've got a lot of amazing friends and colleagues there. And, but when I went there, it's the perspective shift that Dubai gives me. There's a lot of stuff that's the same, but many more things that's different. They think bigger, they move faster. The country moves fast. But it was, it was the perspective, and that's what I love about travel and being different places. It's even better when you know people there and you get to spend time with people who live there. But yeah, it's perspective, how different perspectives can give you very, very different thoughts and beliefs, and, um, and how obviously travel is a great, uh, a great catalyst for that. So perspective and debt, and you could rack up a lot of debt gaining those perspectives by traveling. <laughs> if you don't have the cash to do it, it can get very expensive, but... Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's 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 the thought. So, let's dig into today's show, Brad. What are we what are we digging into? Oh, so this is episode three of four about my new book uh, called "Onboarded: How to Bring New Hires to the Point Where They Are Effective Faster." Um, so, one part of that is this concept that I bring called onboarding debt. Okay, so uh, we've all heard about sleep debt, right? So we know that sleep debt. We're supposed to probably on average get seven to eight hours sleep a night. But if you last night didn't get seven or eight, you got five, let's say, for only one night and then reverted back, you'd probably be okay. You could probably even sustain that for a few days, but you might, you know, get a bit grumpy. Uh, yep. Certainly if your uh, uh, kids might get a bit grumpy, let's just say. But um what about over a few weeks or a few months or over the long term, right? So you can have, you can carry a little bit of sleep debt for a couple of days, but the accumulated debt that you get with not enough sleep can have second order consequences, real tangible effects yep. to your body um, that, you know, like serious disease problems. Uh, and so the that's the analogy uh, to onboarding debt. So if you don't onboard well, and people don't understand how to succeed in the role, it doesn't matter if they're A, B, C players, whatever it is, if people don't understand, that misunderstanding can become a real problem or that lack of understanding because people are doing the things that they think right, but those things may not be the right things. And they can cause lots and lots of tiny little things that can add up, such as people may resign. Uh, ultimately, they may go, oh, I can't really succeed here. Or people, um, they may make mistakes uh, or there could be productivity issues. They may not be doing it, doing it the most efficient way. So we're talking about what is the yeah. cost? What is the cost of onboarding debt? What is it? And sometimes these people even, even, even go toxic and start to drag down the other people on the team who were happy beforehand. You know, I think about this and I'm thinking about so many examples and as i've shared on earlier episodes i get very passionate with ceos when they're hiring new people on making sure they onboard them properly because basically the default 
intent of a new executive is to come in and show what they can do and to do it their way and prove their their value and all of this key stuff and it becomes really really messy really fast i you know just with a client last week and they have a newer hr person who went on and made some some changes and uh to their performance review process which i've, I've been to this movie a few times <laughs> someone who's new to the company may or may not have been the right person to make the choice tweaks their performance review process and people are talking about how it's long and cumbersome and complicated and all the energy goes into administration versus the conversation and at the end of the day it's you know this person wasn't brought up to speed one of the things in this company is everything's meant to be really simple right yeah. they're operators and they want to make it so not a bad person and i don't even know that that um it may have it was likely a bad decision but they were doing the best they could from what they knew. They just didn't know enough to do it in a way that would have been effective for the whole organization. Yeah, yeah. Um, last week, we spoke about good fit and bad fit, right? And the problem when we look at a person who's been hired on reflection as being good or bad fit, like what happens is that we can think, well, they were always going to be a good or bad fit. There was nothing that we could do. There was no yeah. point. Instead, we're thinking about people... Uh, along a spectrum from definitely will fit to definitely won't fit everybody falls within there and and so our job is to cause them to be a successful fit or an unsuccessful fit by way of the process now this comes about by three areas okay first of all it's the cultural expectations so what are the cultural expectations that we've got to that a person has got to understand about our team. We do things differently to other people's. That's core values and behaviors and all of that stuff. They've got to understand what's right and what's wrong and what grinds our gears, perhaps. Second is the technical and process expectations. We do things slightly different to everyone else. And then third is the manager's expectations. Who does that new hire report to and how do they define success in the role and what has to happen as a result of that? So if they, no one will understand on their first day all of those things, no one. It's just simply not possible. And so that gap is what we call onboarding debt. Yeah. And the hard part about it is it, it creates the debt that both the company and they have to pay because of their frustration with not knowing enough and it's harder for them to succeed. In many ways, it's kind of like they're running in mud and they can't get yeah. traction and everything takes way more energy than it should. And then for the team, they're getting frustrated. Why are they doing it right? Why are they doing it weird? Why, you know, it, it, you know, and it's just unnecessary burden for them and the organization. I, I, I think about so many examples, like I shared, shared before. I know one I remember, um, a company, we were having our uh, retreat, annual planning retreat in Mexico. And there was this new exec that had joined. And, you know, this, this team is like a family, like it's tight. So they invite him out, you know, to the dinners after the events and things like that. He never went to any of the dinners after the events or anything because he just did his job and went home because yeah. in the company he was working with, that's what you did. Well, in this, it's kind of like inviting you to grandma's 95th birthday and you don't attend. It's a problem, <laughs> but nobody knew. So we're down in Mexico and on the first night, you know, someone said, Hey, well, why don't you come join us in the hot tub? And he just went in early and went to bed early. And um, what he didn't realize is that the, the invite was like a rhetorical invite. It wasn't a, do you want to? It's when are you going to? And even, even the women on the team, like the, this, this is a team, it's a young team. And the women don't want to be sitting in a hot tub with eight guys. No. But they sit on the edge of the hot tub and have conversation and are connected. They're not going to, you know, and that's their choice. Whether, and again, whether they get it, get in a hot tub or don't isn't is in the point. The point is they are not, they, it's not something they want to be doing, but they, but they go because it's connection time. It's like family time. And so go ahead, Brad, you got something there. It's a cultural expectation. That's all. It is. It is a cultural expectation that you are after dinner, hanging out conversation, hot tub, whatever it happens to be. So we told this guy, I pulled him aside and said, hey, just so you know, when they invite you to the hot tub, it's rhetorical. It's actually, you got to be there. And not being there is like insulting them. 
It's like, what's wrong? You think you're better than we are or what? Who knows what the story is? It's actually not acceptable in this company. One goes to the hot tub. We all go to the hot tub. So I explained it to him. He's in the hot tub. Everything's all good. He just, in the place he worked before, you did your job and he went home. And this is more like a family. That's not how it happens. And again, you know, if someone doesn't tell you, how do you get upset with a person? Well, you can't. And that's the point. There's so many, many, many tiny things that define success in a role across these three areas. Yeah. Now, if that person wasn't fortunate enough to have a Kevin whisper in his ear, then when would he have picked that up? He could have ultimately just get yeah. forced out of the team. Okay. But here's the thing. It's not Kevin's responsibility. Right? No. And, and let me clarify why, by the way, because we, we, we did three sixties and we were going to give the feedback and he got some horrible feedback. I was giving him a heads up to prepare him because that's normally not my job anyways, but it shouldn't have to come to that. It should be explained what the cultural norms are up front. So it doesn't need to be to that point. Yeah, it's his, the, the new hires manager's job to get them to understand. Yes. To get them to understand all of those things. And that's the whole purpose of onboarding. I'm advocating a 90-day onboarding process, but this is an example of best practice, right? Do, you do you. Yeah. Okay. We exactly. certainly want it to align with the legal statutory compliances of your um part of the world so that if they're an unsuccessful fit you can exit them without recrimination without issue that's yep. why we've got those probation periods all around the world built into law yeah it's almost like they need a probation period the other way around you know did the company well they actually there is because some people quit but you know is the company actually doing their job to help people be successful are they holding up their end of the bargain yeah but that's that's capitalism like that's the the market will you will suffer onboarding debt okay and you'll have to yeah. service that debt just like you need to service financial debt right with yeah. a monthly repayment through lower yeah. productivity uh worse attrition and cultural challenges you know I, I remember there was a uh there was a guy david uh who i worked with and he reported to a ceo on a team that i work with He'd been with the company for seven years, okay? And after seven years, this was becoming a bit of a problem. And I asked the CEO, so how well does David understand how to succeed in the role on a score of one to 10, okay? And he his CEO rated him 4.5 after seven years, okay? And this is not uncommon. If you've got a problem, you ask that question, how well do they understand how to succeed in the role? And that's really what this book is born of, that question, right? So. So if he's rated 4.5, you know, it's not necessarily David's fault. It's it's absolutely not. Unless the manager and managers fail at these all kinds of things, giving feedback, telling people what they need to improve, telling people what they need to do. Like people can't read your damn mind. So ideally you have processes up front to bring people on board. Now, maybe David didn't have the cognitive ability to absorb or the desire to do it. But generally, people don't give enough direction. And, and, you know, there's a chapter in my book, um, Your Oxygen Mask First. Uh, it says, teach people to meet your expectations. Yeah. You know, and there's this belief out there that CEOs and executives are hard asses and tough and demanding. And although they do have high expectations, they often don't give enough. It's common for them not to give enough feedback. Some are great at it, but giving feedback and because people just want to do a great work, but they got to know what you want. Here's the thing about Dave. Dave had a team of like 16, 17 people. So if Dave had an understanding of 4.5, what was the onboarding debt that was carried, right? Because there's no other opportunity to learn. It's, we think that people are going to learn by osmosis after onboarding. And how can you be in your job if you only have that level of understanding of how to do your job? Like it, it, it seems illogical. Like how is it possible? Well, let me reframe that question. How well does David understand how to succeed in the role to the uh, uh, to your definition of success, uh, Mr. Yeah. Mrs. CEO? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not, but that's, but that's how we end up having to fire people. That's how we have people having to leave. Like 
It's the job well, to be done. It's CEO management. It was a horrible job if 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 they allowed that. I mean, it's it's mm. yeah, yeah, um, possibly. Or that 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 CEO had a wonderful opportunity to learn and grow. Uh, oh, you're so nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, another <laughs> another story I remember. There was another CEO. I you know when I did the interviews for this book. Here's a quick one. There was one person I remember who shall remain nameless. And and this person said, here's the thing. I tell them once, I, and if they don't pay any attention, I'm not going to tell them again. I'm too busy. I don't have the time for that. If they're good, then they'll take it and they'll remember it and they'll do it the right way. But that person would have been cured massive, massive onboarding debt. Um there was another person that I remember and that person wanted to get new hires working as quickly as possible, right? And that's the subtitle to the book, right? We want to get them working more effective faster. So he did an on uh, pardon me, an induction, right? Which was, you know, a day or two, a couple of days where, oh, this is how you do this, this, but very much like training induction, but no onboarding. Okay, so people didn't understand how to succeed in their role and what that meant too is that every month when I'd meet with the CEO, he was always cleaning up people's problems and he was always spending all of his time um, solving this problem, solving that one. Oh, why can't I get good people to work for me? And it's like the well, subtext is, well, they don't understand how to succeed. Yeah. Help them, help them to win. Yeah. I think another example I was thinking about, like we had a meeting with an awesome client I'm working with. Um, they're, health tech company doing amazing work and we did our quarterly talent review and there's a manager that's been on the team for nine months and i think we didn't get cover it we didn't cover it last quarter but he's been on team he's an awesome leader and we're going through the talent review and his key team members and uh he didn't understand the document like this is a core document that we use to help us to clarify you know, how our people are doing and how we can help them to perform better and helps us to make our people decisions. But as we went through it, I'm like, damn it. He, he's a new guy that joined the team. No one explained it to him. And in reality, even as the, as the coach and kind of advisor to the team, I probably should have done a mini session with him to teach him the document and how it works. It's a, it's one of our most important documents for talent management. It is our most important document for talent management. But he he didn't even understand some of the questions. Yeah. And I was like, that, that's a fail. That's that's on us. That's a failure of us for not training and teaching them how to do it. You know, in the in the book, one of the things I talk about is uh, assessing a person who's completed their onboarding process and uh, asking three questions. How well does new hire understand um, the culture on a scale of one to ten? How well does the new hire understand the technical and processes and how well do they understand their manager's expectations? And the example that I give, it's a six, a six and a seven that the, the person gives hypothetically, which equals an average of 6.3 or 63%, right? And then we go back and we say, so they don't understand 37% of the role at that point, Okay. And so if you were to buy a map that didn't show you 37% of the roads in a city, <laughs> you'd take it back, right? Yeah. Or you'd get lost. Or you'd get lost and that would be expensive. That's awesome. And that's onboarding debt. I love it. That's all, So the, the, the summary of what we're talking about here is that if you truly don't onboard people properly, you incur a debt. And the company builds a debt, which they got to pay interest on that debt. Um, the individual feels that debt and they got to put additional energy and labor into trying to do their job and redoing things and dealing with a lot of frustration. Nobody wins. And it can be solved by spending a bit more strategic time up front to map out what's required to be successful. And, and you're not going to cover everything, but you could probably cover a heck of a lot more. Not only will you get more, a higher percentage of the people that you bring on being successful, most likely, unless your hiring practice is perfect, but more likely you'll help more people be successful uh, and sooner, which is a benefit to you, benefit to them, 
And it's just a matter of being conscious about how you do it. And that's not leaving it up to luck. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. All right, good chip. So um, avoid onboarding debt by doing an effective onboarding process. Um, the financials are outstanding. Um, that's for sure. So next week, we're going to be transferring from onboarding debt into what do we actually do about this? We've spent three episodes talking about um, what it is and how it works and why it's an issue. Now, next week, we're going to be talking about how do you actually effectively do that and drawing from the book. Uh, good chat today. So uh, this has been the Growth Whisperers podcast. My name is Brad Giles. Again, we've spoken about the new book, Onboarded today um and my co-host kevin lawrence you can find him at lawrenceandco.com there's a very interesting newsletter every week you may or may not be interested in probably may uh and myself brad giles uh, i do a weekly newsletter as well uh at, and you can find me at evolutionpartners.com.au hope you've enjoyed this episode about onboarding debt look forward to chatting again next week have a great week